Hello and welcome yet again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community since 2003, bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now in our newest chapter of serving the saltwater fishing community, the Saltwater Podcast Series. In the Saltwater Podcast Series, We reach out to our friends, the captains and guides along the North Carolina coast and get them to share their knowledge, their insights to help you, our listeners, catch more fish more often. But really, the bigger goal isn't more fish more often. I think it's just to get you to spend more time on the water more often with more family and friends making more memories. This week, we have a red drum feature. We actually have a duo coming at you, a tournament fishing team of Rob Corley and Jake Kite, Captain Rob Corley of Sandbar Safari Charters and Captain Jake Kite of Inshore Addiction Charters. So they both charter out of the Swansboro area. They're both Redfish tournament partners, and they are going to talk to us today about catching more slot red drum on light tackle. And it's going to be full of information. I feel like we're going to run out of time, but we're going to apply them for as much information as we can. I'm joined as I am every week, every episode, with my co-host, Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Hello, Billy. What's going on, Gary? Good to see you again, man. Yeah, man. It's always good. Always. You know, we have this standing date. You know, we get to talk fish, listen to fish, and... And see what's happening. Learn about fish and learn about captains. That's my favorite part. Learning all these secret captain stories that we don't even get to share. <laughs> and some we shouldn't share. Some of these stories we shouldn't share. <laughs> That's pretty true. Uh, speaking of sharing, I'm going to go ahead and share this slide with you. So you can share our podcast. Uh, it's available on all kinds of different platforms. Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube as well. So make sure you subscribe to those channels. Um, and the biggest way that you can help promote the podcast is word of mouth. Share it with your friends. Uh, and be sure to share and go by and visit our sponsor, Marine Warehouse Center. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and play a little video from them. But awesome company to, to do business with if you're looking for a boat. So here's a little message from them. This is Robbie at Marine Warehouse Center, and we're excited to announce that we are the exclusive North and South Carolina Sailfish dealer. Sailfish offers an offshore capable boat with tons of family friendly features. Whether you're a hardcore offshore fisherman or you just want to island hop, Sailfish can do it all. All right, Gary, who's buying me a Sailfish? Anybody? Anybody? Um, no? All right. All right. Maybe Emmett. Maybe. And that is my segue. <laughs> My favorite part, probably my favorite part of the whole podcast right here. Into a little known fact about Emmett Stovall, one of the owners of Marine Warehouse. And I think this is odd. This is certainly rare that Emmett is one of the few people I know that roots equally for both Duke and UNC. No. Nobody, equally. Nobody does that. Well, guess which one <laughs> Guess which one he roots for? I'd say he's a Duke fan. NC State. Uh, I, I mean... That was the obvious one, but I was going to go See what I did the there? Grain. See what Tricked I did there? Me. Gave you a Tricked choice, me. and it was not on the, th- on the table? <laughs> I'm going to show you a little fish picture, Gary. What do you think? I'd love to see a fish Here one. we go. This is Lloyd Blackman with a red drum caught in the Cherry Grove area using a Carolina rigged pinfish. Pretty good looking fish right there. I don't think he released that fish. I don't know. No, <laughs> no definitely not. <laughs> I think he enjoyed that fish for dinner. Released it to the skillet. Right oh, on. Yeah. Awesome, man. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this up as I always do before we sort of transition in. Um, I want to make sure that Billy's paying attention while we're doing our podcast here. I don't want him to sort of zone out over there in front of that control board. Pretend like he's pretend like he's paying attention. So Billy, once again, All right. at the conclusion of Rob and Jake's conversation, I am going to be asking you for Billy's best takeaway. Billy's best takeaway. All right. All right. I'm taking notes. I want you to do a good job this time. Not that you don't do a good job normally, but I'm really looking for you to do a good job. You got two guys to listen to. And what are we talking about? I can't remember. No. (laughs) 
<laughs> so let me introduce our let me introduce our talent today. Again, it is Captain Rob Corley of Sandbar Safari Charters, Captain Jake Kite of Inshore Addiction Charters. They both charter out of the Swansboro area, and they are Redfish Tournament partners. They fish Red Drum Tournament circuit together. Welcome to the show for the first time, a, a duo at the same time. Welcome, Rob and Jake. Hey, guys. How you doing? How y'all doing? All right. You're there. We got two people on the screen. This is going to happen. We're going to have our first duo interview. And, uh, we're doing- and we're, again, we're going to be talking about catching more slot red drum on light tackle. And now before I ask my viewers to sit through 30, 40 minutes of listening to you guys talk, I want you to qualify yourselves. I want you to answer the standard, why should anyone listen to you talk about a red drum? Um, well, do you make somebody brag about themselves right when you get it started, Gary? That's tough. Uh, <laughs> I've been guiding uh, inshore for the last 12 years um, and primarily targeting red drum, every other species too, but uh, a lot of red drum fishing. And uh, we've been fishing tournaments for the last five, six years, um, and a couple more for me. So a bunch of tournament wins and several thousand charters catching redfish with four-year-olds and 94-year-olds. So I hope it qualifies. Um, that, that qualifies. You have successfully passed the first challenge of this podcast, and we're ready to move forward. But I caught Jake everything he knows about redfish so that you can just count that as double. Yeah, I've been guiding for six years now. I make a living catching redfish. Right on, man. I'm look. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say about red drum. But before we get to red drum, we have one more feature. It's the it's the two questions. I'm not exactly sure it fits the two questions format this time, but it's non fishing related questions. And so what I was reflecting on is like, all right, I am talking to a red drum couple. So let me ask you some questions based on famous <laughs> couples. Through the years, I'm going to give you one name. You give me the partner name. I'm going to go back. I'm going to, this is going to be dated at first. Fred Flintstone and Wilma. (laughs) (laughs) Then we're off to a great start. Bert and Ernie. All right. (laughs) We got, wait, you're, you're too early with the claps. I got two more. I'm going to get more current. Calvin and Hobbs. And then last, Beavis and... Oh, butthead. All right, let's talk Red Drum. So, <laughs> Tell them what they won, Gary. It was very good. <laughs> so my understanding is that we're talking about catching more slot Red Drum on light tackle, and we're going to cover such areas as bait versus artificial, high tide versus low tide. We've got a lot to cover. Um I'm going to leave it up to you guys. Like I I know you guys are well-versed and my job is to sort of stay out of the way and let you do what you do. So I'm going to leave it to you. Where are we going to start this conversation? Um, I think a good path to start is uh, just talking about how we take charters and we've got to uh, kind of catch a a tough fish in shallow water um, with a lot of inexperienced anglers. And uh, what we've basically developed over the years is a lot of live bait and dead bait tactics for them. Um, so that we can cast for the charter, we can teach the charter to cast, um, the bait can be cast to an area and stay there for a period of time, and if it's a good spot for it to be, red drum, they use their nose a lot, and uh, they're they're pretty good hunters for, if there's a good piece of bait close to them, they're going to find it, so uh, that's always been a very effective charter tactic, um, because a lot of times you'll have multiple people on the boat so if everybody's throwing top orders it's it's really difficult to do that with multiple people on the boat and uh it's just always we've always been working on ways to catch the charters more fish and uh something that's always worked really well for that is live bait and then if i'm going by myself and i want to catch a redfish for fun or, or my one for my limit to eat you know, I'll catch them on top order because it's the best strike uh, on the inshore that we got, and it's, it's a good time. So it really depends on how many fish you want to catch and the experience of your anglers um, and what kind of day you're having. But a slow, crummy day, if the weather up, if it's blowing 20 mile an hour like it is here all the time, then uh, there's no shame in that live finger mold, a cut piece of Menhaden to catch that drum. And if you want to go on a technical fly hunting mission and 
catch them on a six weight and a, a fly, then then that's a good way to do it too. So it's just sort of depends on how you want to fish for them. All right. So I guess what we're doing is we'll look at different locales. We'll look at different conditions. And then you can tell me the different options that you sort of go over when you do it. And I think one of the cons, you just threw a lot at me. I was trying to keep up. I mean, I knew you guys were going to be full of information. So I think you said something (laughs) about shallower water. So maybe that's where we start, I guess, like whether it's high tide or low tide or whether it's shallow water or deep water. You take it you take it from there and then sort of walk me through your process of how to best target that particular condition and, and how for high tide how that would differ from low tide or deep water how that would differ from shallow water. Sure. Um, bait placement. Uh, yeah, bait placement makes a big difference. Um, right now this time of year we're fishing a lot of shallow water. Uh, the majority of the drum have moved into the backwaters uh from the surf where they winter over and up in the rivers they're starting to be more active coming out of the creeks uh and into the the shallower broader parts of the river and so most of the areas that will target drum over the next three four months uh, until the fall um are going to be less than three foot of water foot of water less than four foot of water depending on the tide so we're going to be targeting them in shallow creeks and shallow bays uh and on flats in the rivers So our primary tactics are going to shallow water to find these fish. And then um, our bait placement, like Jake was saying, you know, what do you want to do on high tide versus low tide? If we're if we're in a bay uh, in the marsh with uh, some moisture structure and stuff around, like just, I don't know, tell us about like what you like to do on high tide versus low tide with where you put that bait. Oh, yeah. yeah. Doesn't matter whether you're fishing artificial or live bait. Either way, you want to target where the fish are going to be and, when you got a high tide, those fish are going to be up close to that grass, and and when you got a water tide, you're going to fish out on the ends of those points. I never even notice except for on a real blood out tide. But you want to want to get your baits where the fish are. That's the important part. And that time on the water, you will figure that out as you plop a bait in places. But the higher the water, the closer to the grass. The lower the water, the farther off the points you need to be. Yeah, it seems like as soon as they can hit that grass, um, they do it and just uh, kind of going at low tide and looking at, at different spots on low water and seeing, you know, if there's mud against the grass at low tide or if there's a foot of water against the yep. grass at low tide. Um, on low tide, you're going to want to fish that place with a foot of water against the grass. You know, you got that you got that little bit of water they can get into. And on high tide, you might want to fish the place that has no water up against the grass on low tide because they're only going to be there once that tide fills up and they can get up on that edge. So that one foot mark, is that pretty standard as far as like you're, you're going to need at least a foot of water up against that grass? I mean, is a foot of water good enough or are you like even more depth when you're targeting that grass line? Usually um, we fish a lot of flats at a lot of different tides. So we kind of get a lot of the same flats at different tides. So we kind of get to see what they do at, at all different tides. And it seems like as soon as there's 10 to 12 inches of water to the grass, those fish are going to start working up to that grass. And um, a lot of times at high tide, if you're working a, a, a marsh edge, a grass edge, like we're kind of talking about in shallow water, um, if there's pockets through it or around it, by mid tide, there a lot of fish are already up into those pockets, oh, especially yeah. the smaller ones, the, the 17, 18, 19 inchers. Um, so, and, and at high tide, all the fish might be up in there. So you might be looking for a, a shoreline without a break in it in shallow water at high tide where those fish can't get away from you necessarily up into the grass, but they'll be right along the edge of it um, because if they can flood up into it, they will. So that's that's kind of the mark of where I think those drum will be in relationship to the grass because almost everywhere we fish in shallow water except up in the rivers, um, there, there's going to be marsh grass around. So that, that's a good <clears throat> visual cue on where to place your bait. All right, man. So I got a grass line and then I got a point. So let's start with the grass line. And you say, uh, everyone I think follows, like, you got to go where the fish are. So now how am I working that grass line? Like, you know, tell me about how, I, how you're positioning the boat and then tell me, you know, what you do with artificials, how you position the boat when you're fishing live bait or cut bait, whatever you're doing, like, Walk me through that process of the grass line, and then and then you can move on to you know how it might change much if we go to that point. All right, like say if you're coming into a bay, a shallow bay that's two or three foot deep, um, 
with some breaks or some creeks that come into it, maybe some oyster bars in it. Like if you come up in there, what what are you gonna where are you gonna be plopping baits? Where are you gonna be working those top waters across at mid tide? At mid tide, probably at like the corners of those pockets where it goes up onto the shallower water, run it up in the shallow water and out past the points that of those pockets there on mid tide because they're probably the big fish probably aren't quite up there in that foot of water yet, but you'll catch you a you know, 17, 18, 19 inch or something like that. But I'm going to work any point, any piece of structure, grass line with scattered grass that is going to eventually be flooded up. You can almost guarantee the fish are going to be looking to get somewhere in there so they can get up on the next level once the tide gets where they want. So you're going to hit the scattered grass edges and, and mostly any points or rounded off edges of those um, little what I call scallop bays. And what artificial am I throwing and what am I doing to best present that artificial and then transition to live bait and what am I throwing live bait wise, rig wise, and how am I presenting that? Jake's been smacking them on top waters the last couple yeah. of days. Tell them what you've been using. Yeah, man. I, I throw a top water uh, bass rig actually like a skitter walk and, and it's just, you know, like I was saying about the points and, you know, working the scattered grass, you want to throw that top water past where you think the fish is. And get your line to lay right so you can work it to the fish. And if you work it right past where that fish is, should be and if he's there, he'll eat that bait. If you're throwing a jig, I like to throw the jig just on the point. It's almost like a, I don't know, it's like it surprises them. They look at it and they see it a little bit and then I've had them chase them off the points. So uh, top water, you want to go across the point, across the oyster rock, work your way back. Um, jigs, you kind of, I just, I like to throw mine up there and let them fall in nice and slow and flutter down and, and, and work just uh, like that. Yeah, I think the jig you got to kind of put a little bit closer to his nose. It's got a quieter splash and entry, and the top water he can obviously see and hear from a little further away, um, without a doubt. But uh, there's definitely there's definitely some big differences in what a drum will react to with a top water or a jig or a live bait in, in any different situation. Sure. So some of those topics are really neat to cover. Um, if you guys want to talk about some of that, like, like what, a, what a redfish will do <clears throat> when you throw them a top water versus when you throw a, a, a finger mullet on a Carolina rig over there. Yeah, I'm, I'm in, that's what I want to hear, man. That, I but, mean, I'm hanging on everything. This is good. So, so uh, there's, there's been tons of times where I'll pull up to a, a shoreline in a shallow bay and there's some redfish there, whether it's a pot of five or six or it's a school of 50 or whatever, uh, or it's two. A lot of times it's none, so <laughs> I might have to go to three more shallow bays with a shallow shoreline to find them, but uh, eventually we'll run into some. But there's many times where I'll throw a top water, especially when I, I, I was uh, fishing a lot more artificial when I started 10, 12 years ago. I was fishing mostly artificial, um, and I found that there was a lot of places I'd throw a top water across. I might get one blow up. I might not get any blow ups, uh, and then I'd pitch a finger mullet or a piece of cut bait or whatever the time of year dictated uh what bait i had on board dictated and mm. i would catch that drum oh, and yeah. uh it, it, jake will tell you i've done the same thing over, jigs and jigs over and, and over jigs. and over again you'll find that your most effective way of knowing if a drum is there or not is with a piece of bait a live bait a chunk of bait um but the more fun way of catching them is on the artificial. Absolutely. Um, and a lot of times jigs and, and top orders can be great for searching out new areas to cover ground quickly because the way we fish with uh, Carolina rigs and, and popping corks and other live bait setups is you're going to set up on a, a point, a shoreline. You're going to spread out three or four baits, maybe five even, depending on how many people you got on the boat. And you're going to sit there for five minutes with those baits out and see if, that, if it happens. Because the quieter it is, the less splashes, the more likely those fish are going to be happy feeding and roaming around looking for your stuff. And then uh, if it doesn't happen, maybe you give it another round. And then that's 10 minutes. And it's, it's excruciatingly uh, slow if, if it doesn't happen. So it's a lot more fun to flip a bait out there and cover ground and stuff. So yep. if you're trying to move through a larger area, uh, find new water, work different points kind of quickly, the best way to do it is with that artificial. And uh, a top water is great because you can get a, a visual blow up without even hooking the fish. You can yeah. you can get a good sight on if they're there or not. That's a good point. Yeah, you know exactly where those fish are hanging on that structure 
you run a top water over them. You know, if they're 10 feet off the point, if they're on it, if there's a little channel somewhere, especially on the right side. Yeah, and if you get, you that, get, blow up on, if you get that blow up on top water, then you can log that in your memory, you know, yep. and go back to it later, or you can pull off of it a little bit, stop, wait a couple minutes, pitch a couple live baits over there, and you'll know if they're there for sure or not. And then you'll start to find out how many are there because if you catch one or two on a top water off a point, and you've been there fishing it for an hour, you might think, oh, there was a couple drum there. But if you sit there for an hour and fish live bait, you might find out, dang, there was 20 drums sitting there, right. and I caught eight or 10 of them in an hour. Uh, but the only the only time you're going to catch a ton of redfish on, on artificial in the shallows is if they are fired up and they are schooled up and you're just catching the right time of day, the right, everything, all the conditions are perfect, and those fish haven't probably seen other anglers recently and um I'll, I'll see it what what would you say a redfish school does uh, a lot of times in the spring we find them schooled up pretty good in numbers you know 50 to 300 you know sometimes even more oh yeah yeah, yeah. and it, what would you say a redfish school does day one two and three of you going to fish them with charters if nobody else is fishing them? oh the difference between like day one two and three yeah oh man day one they're just dumb as could be and they'll eat anything you throw in 20 or 30 that's when you change your baits and see what all works that you got in your tackle box that you you ain't got enough confidence in to to try and then day two they're a little bit wiser some of them are sore lip and day three you're probably chasing them around yeah you'll catch two or three right when you get on and then they'll move and then exactly. you'll go was, find yeah. them and if you're if you're good at finding them again and, and sneaking up on them you'll catch two or three and boom they'll move and so you've caught six in two hours when the first day you caught them three days ago you caught 15 20 of them like it was stupid so yeah. it really depends on how that area has been worked and and that's a little bit where the pressure comes into play um and it, it's weird because that school could move two days later and show up in another place and the first person to find them there will experience that same bite that you experienced that first day you found them but then it will decrease over time if uh if they if they stay pressured so we're headed into the summer, and so I'm guessing we're going to find more pressured fish than dumb, innocent, untouched fish. Yes, so, but the beautiful thing about the summertime and uh, something that we, we talk about all the time, like we used to love the winter and the spring because the redfish were schooled up. You could go find right. seven different schools. You could bust them up all you wanted to. It wasn't a big deal. If one school wasn't eaten, you'd go to another one and they'd chew. But now the pressure for inshore fishing in all of North Carolina has, has increased. I've lived yeah. here my whole life, and, and I've seen it in the last 20 years explode with the number of people fishing inshore, and uh, especially in the last 10 years for redfish. And uh, the summertime used to be like, oh, man, they're going to scatter out. It's going to be hard to you know go catch 10 of them or something in a day. But now we crave that summertime bite because it does scatter the redfish out. Absolutely. And it, we can go fish five or six different spots in a, a half-day trip or, you know, a, a day's fishing and, and catch red, a couple redfish in every spot. But in the wintertime or the early spring, if we go to that school and they're shut down and we go to that next school and they're shut down, That's we, might, just... we might catch one, two fish, and, and it's aggravating. Um, and, and so – where we used to catch a lot of fish when they were schooled up, the pressure that that makes those schools act differently, we now like the summertime when they're not schooled up, when they're broken up and scattered out everywhere, and we can go a bunch of different places and catch a fish or two instead of having to rely on those bodies of fish um, to cooperate. So. Yep, I agree, man. Yeah. You can go anywhere during the summertime. I like that's when I like to throw the top water baits the most. When you can catch them, you know, catch one fish on every four points you regular across there correctly. That's fun. And they spread out. That's when you need to know the water the best. You know, you need to know how to get in there to fish certain areas that, you know, not everybody's trampling around in when they're schooled up. Now, that'll, that'll make you a better angler right there. Yeah, most definitely. And and that's a, a thing with, we, we're talking about top waters a lot. We don't ever fish top waters in the winter for them. No, really they ever. won't swing like a, on it. They're too a slow. really, really warm day where you find a school and the first couple casts across and they might whack that thing. But we usually don't start fishing top waters till late April, early like, May. Yeah. And, about now, and we year. don't usually let our charters throw top water until June. That's a lot of <laughs> <laughs> Till June, yeah. Man, I love that way of looking at uh, the summer bite. I hadn't thought of it, but what you, it makes sense that they're scattered. gives you more opportunity to find a fish, a couple of fish, a handful of fish. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. So the same, I guess in that same vein where, you know, pressured fish, you know, could be looked at as a challenging condition, but maybe not. Um, talk to me a little bit about like clean and clear conditions versus dirty, windy conditions. Oh, man. Tell us um, about the wind, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> the wind. It blows here once in a while. It blows, but um, I don't, I, I think the wind is your friend in a lot of ways because the fish don't know you're there. You know, if you know where fish are, you can understand what your the terrain or the the environment that you're fishing. You can approach it correctly with the wind. Use the elements as your friend. I prefer a windy day. Might you know ring your ears a little bit afterwards, but the fish don't have a clue you're there. And if you stay far enough away from them, that's that's your best opportunity to catch plenty of, them, in my opinion. On a calm day, you gotta chase them all around. They know you're there. Somebody you know slams a lid on your boat, or you stomp around too much and and they're up, and you can watch them hunt 200 yards away from where you are. And no idea that they would ever go that far, but they will on a my, sick day. My ideal day would be, like, medium clarity and medium wind. Because oh, yeah, a little bit of wind helps disguise you. Yep. Um, but if it's blowing too hard, you can't throw artificials really hardly oh, yeah, at all yeah, unless yeah. you're going straight down wind. Um, and uh, on a, a super clear, calm conditions, you can see the redfish, and it's good for finding redfish, but it's not always the best for catching them. Yeah. Um, so, like you know, like I said, medium clarity, medium wind is is like prime conditions. And, I was, uh, it definitely helps disguise you. Yeah. Uh, when that when that little bit of chop is on the water, I remember a charter like my second or third year of guiding, where I, there was a place a shallow three foot bay where I'd been on some redfish. There was a little pod of fifteen or twenty of them in there, and some scattered fish too. And I went in there and caught the crap out of them. And I went in there a few days later or a week later. And it was slick, baby slick calm. And when I started easing into that place, I saw every redfish wake out and move. But he was 150 yards away from me oh, when he did yeah. it. And I was like, I'm not going to catch any of these fish unless I sit for a place for 20 minutes and they settle and start easing Even around. The or, bait so I'm not going to like chase one of these down and catch them. I'm, that, the one that I see moving, I can't chase them with my trolling motor right now because if it's going at a one or a two on the trolling motor he's moving and uh so those conditions are really good for finding fish but they're not the best for catching them yeah that's a fact so and when i was talking about oh go ahead well uh you can finish that thought man i, I what i was just going to throw out because i was enjoying that is uh so on the dirtier conditions on the dirtier water conditions you know not so much top water but i think more people might be throwing the jig the jig soft plastic like I guess I'd ask yeah. you about that, man. You know, if you have color, if you, you know, if what your how it might change what you throw given on the conditions. Again, not so much for top water or even bait, but you're welcome to talk right. about either. But I just think more like you have so many soft plastic options. Yeah, if you got a charter that wants to catch some artificial drum, or if you want to go there for fishing a tournament and it's it's crummy conditions, like what are some options for well, that? Well, I'm gonna go with something that's got some scent, and then I'm gonna put some more scent on it. <laughs> and i want to throw something it depends on the time of year if shrimp is what you know should be on the flats right now i'm gonna throw you know something that's more of a, a shrimp imitation a shrimp color something that matches that if you know um definitely scent i like white in dirty water to be honest with you a white shrimp uh i think it's got the right profile and and it's solid so the fish can see it real good um, I'll go with a new penny on, on some dirty brown water, the shrimp are around a whole lot or, you know, the natural color, something like that. But I'll, I'll definitely add some, add some scent to it and, uh, work it a little slower. What scent you yeah. adding? Mm, we're primarily fishing, uh, gulp soft plastics. <clears throat> so they're already scented and, yeah. uh, we typically will, uh, some, I mean, I'll put some Procure there's, on them, sucker. There's, but. there's plenty of time. The scent that we both use the most is Procure. Yeah. And uh, hashtag not a sponsor. But yeah, I was about the, to say. I didn't the want stuff to drop works. Any the stuff that. works great. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I we, we both we on our charters we put Procure on cut bait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah add add some Procure to some cut bait. Um, and honestly, we've probably attributed. <laughs> three or four of our eight charter wins, I mean, uh, tournament, tournament wins, wins yeah. to Procure on top of Gulp Bait, Carolina Rig. Sorry, there's a secret. There it goes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
But, uh, yeah, in the, in the darker water, you want to I, – I think it really just depends on where you're fishing. You know, you want to match. If you're up in, like, the river where the water is tannic, dark yeah. but not dirty – you the know? difference of tannic water yeah. and dirty water. So, yeah. like, chalky water, uh, when we have really rough, so when it's really rough in the ocean for a period of time and we get really chalky water in the ocean, uh, it's almost that white, blue, chalky kind of color. Yes. And th when that comes in, the backwaters and the marshes between the barrier islands uh, and the waterway on the incoming tide, that's when I do the worst in those areas. For yeah. It doesn't matter if it's redfish, trout, flounder, whatever. When that chalky water is coming in from the uh, ocean on a rising tide, I vacate those areas and go up, up river, up creek, uh, waterway, some, somewhere away from that because that chalky water doesn't do good. But the tannic water is fine. Uh, Rainwater is fine. Really, it's yep. a tolerance of how much bait there is. Uh, a lot of times, redfish will push way up into the sweet water when you get a rain. Um, it really depends on where the bait's flushing out to. Uh, earlier in the season, spring, uh, early summer, the bait's flushing out of the upper reaches of the estuaries, and later into the fall, uh, it's it's further pushed away from those areas. So, when we get a lot of a lot of rainwater, um, so, so I guess a way to put it would be rainwater is treated differently uh, as as dirty and ocean dirty water, water yeah. is for us the way we we target redfish and. Clear water, though, we, I try to match whatever's going on out there, you know. Clear water, I'm going to throw something like a, a bait that looks like a mullet. It's got some eyeballs on it or something like that to kind of get them to maybe draw off of where they're at to come look at that bait, you know. Yeah. Get an idea because you can get a little shimmer out of it now. There's, there's very few times when redfish can see better than they can smell better right. in, in our waters. Right. Uh, and if they can see better, uh, like a live target mullet, um, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's been times where... I'll never throw that bait, but like when it's crystal clear for some reason, they love it, and I think it's because they can see it real good. All right, you've given me some, you've given us some good insight on artificials, you know, some smell, some different techniques with that. And while you've mentioned bait, I haven't really pushed for any details on bait. I know a lot of people watching this podcast like to fish with red drum for red drum with bait. So help me out, give me a little bit more information on bait fishing insights. And again, what I would say is focus a little bit more on the summer months and what I'm specifically looking for, I guess, although I'll go wherever you want to take the conversation is cut bait versus live bait. And if it is cut bait, what kind of cut bait? And if it is live bait, what kind of live bait? What kind of presentation? Typically in the uh, colder months, we like to use cut bait and uh, chunks of crab. And then in the summer months and the fall, we like to use live bait mostly based on what's available. Uh, we can catch finger mullet, shrimp, menhaden, um, a, a ton of stuff in the summertime, in the fall, and uh, in the winter and the spring, it's much more harder to come by. So uh, what we usually do is uh, cut bait in the winter and the spring. You can catch mullets way up into uh, brackish areas, way up in the estuaries and, and, and uh, shallow creeks and stuff. And then uh, once it starts to warm up in the summertime, you can catch finger mullet and menhaden just about anywhere. Um, really, the big determining factor of when we stop using uh, cut bait is when the pinfish show up and the, the crabs really start coming out. Right. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, that's definitely the advantage of a live mullet is stay alive on the hook. Out here, kick can give you another, you know, four or five minutes of a bait, a good solid bait in the strike zone versus something that's getting pulled off the hook or, or eaten off the hook, like cut shad. So you got to play into what's going on out there actually on the water. When the pinfish show up real good, throwing a piece of frozen cut mullet over there, it works, but, you know, it's soft. You want to start looking around, covering water, and looking for your baits, looking for your shad that are in early if you can find them. They work great. Looking for your mullets and your creeks and your little river cuts and eddies you know, anywhere the tide makes a, a little back eddy or something is liable to have you know some mullets you'll see them early in the early in the season you'll see little bitty fry mullets you know and if you go back to those places you know another month 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 and a half later you're liable to find some you know catchable four to you know you don't want a really big live mullet you don't want a really big live mullet you know you want something that you know get that you can cast good and will get out there and make some noise and try to get off that hook and that's going to draw that uh, 
fishing there to get. Yeah, I, I think that uh, during the early season, in the late spring and early summer, um, we use a lot smaller baits compared to what we use in the late summer and early True. fall. True. Because yeah. um, we're matching what's actually out there. You know, what you're catching is what they're they're feeding on. So. Yeah, and uh, the size of the cut bait is, is something that's kind of important because you want something that the fish can smell and see, uh, but you don't want something so big. We're, we're talking about catching mostly slot fish, uh, yeah. and so you don't want something that's so big that they're not going to be able to get into their mouth and uh, get a good hook up on that circle hook. I, I like to use like a, a matchbook is about the perfect size for uh, what Any you want size a, cut bait, a, a cut bait to be. And then yeah. that can catch an 18 incher, that can catch a 30 incher, no problem. Well then, let's uh, we're going to have you back, but let's wrap up this episode. And the way I like to wrap up the episode is like, you, your choice, man. You can give me some final thoughts on red drum fishing, something that you wanted to say that I didn't quite get to, recognizing that we're going to have you guys again, you know, have you back again. But uh, how about it? Let's wrap this episode up. Give me your final thoughts. Help those guys out that are watching this podcast. They want to go out and catch some summer red drum. You want to catch some summer red drum, go catch you some finger mullet, put it on a Carolina rig with a one-ounce weight and a circle hook and throw it close to a piece of grass on high tide, and uh, you will have a good chance of catching a redfish. And then when you want to refine your tactics, uh, go and, and look more in depth about some of the things we talked about and catch our next episode, because we can talk about redfish for hours. Oh, yeah. There's thousands and thousands <laughs> of things we could talk about and little tips and tricks, and but, uh, nothing beats time on the water. And pay attention to where you're fishing. And where you're putting your baits. You know, if you're throwing a bait out there and you forgot where it landed, you're not doing yourself any good if you caught a fish. You don't have a clue where to put the next bait out there. You know, you can't work them like that. So. And if, if you throw a, a bait, especially if you're still fishing with cut bait or, or live bait, uh, like we were talking about here at the end, if you are going to be sitting somewhere for five minutes, you want it to be in a good spot. So you want to make sure your bait placement's good. If you throw a cast and it doesn't quite, I mean, there's... There's been a number of times where either of us have been in a tournament or on a charter and we've thrown a cast out there uh, on a Carolina rig that was a foot to three feet off of exactly where we want it. We reeled it back Brian in, in yeah. throw it back out. Yeah. And uh, that, that's something I don't something even let them hit the water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, get in there. That's not if if you're going to be sitting there for five minutes with a bait, make sure it's in the spot you want it to that's be. That's exactly yeah. right. So you guys are – you're – you can speak at length about Red Drum. I know you guys do more throughout the calendar year, and so this is the part of the show where I say, hey, man, give me the highlight reel. If someone's been watching this, they think, man, I'd like to go fishing with either of those guys. Or in this case, they might be thinking, I want to go fishing with both those guys and just letting them bounce off each other. But if they want to go fishing with you, <laughs> walk, me through the, uh, walk me through the calendar year. Like, What are you guys targeting in the spring, the summer, and the fall? Give me the quick highlight, highlight reel, please. All right, spring, summer, and fall. Spring, I spend a lot of time red fishing. As it starts warming up, I'm switching gears and red fishing, black drum, sheep's head, uh, Spanish mackerel, king mackerel, stuff like that. Yeah, and usually uh, during the summertime uh, and late spring and summertime, we're fishing for everything inshore that you can catch. Yep. Uh, red drum, black drum, sheep's head. And uh, usually later in the fall, we start catching tons of speckled trout. And uh, near shore, we've got mackerels all season and into the fall. Uh, look at, looking for the cobias right now this time of year in uh, May and June. And then I, I personally am down in Florida in January, February, and March because it's cold here. So it's really fun to be yeah, there. I'll be here, though. I'm here, though. We catch redfish. We catch redfish all year. Yeah, I'm calling Jake. And I'm blocking <laughs> Rob Corley yeah. from sending me any more Florida <laughs> photos. I'm going to go fishing with Jake and say, screw Rob Corley. I never liked that guy anyway. Why am I even pretending Jake is more my kind of guy? We got shirts. We got shirts about this, man. That's what all my friends say when I send them pictures from Florida when I'm catching them, <laughs> catching them carping in January and February. Sending me pictures. <laughs> all right, guys. Sincerely, great show. Enjoyed you. Enjoyed your company. Enjoyed your insights. We'll have you back soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. Hey, thank Appreciate you, you man. Gary, and the Fisherman's Post, and you guys are doing a great job with the podcast. 
We yeah. love y'all and looking forward to the next Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Keep it easy, man. I feel you, man. I feel you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Billy. All right, well- Billy, where are you going to start? Oh man, I don't know. So with much your good stuff. assignment of the best <laughs> takeaway, I'm not. I don't envy this assignment right now. What do you got? Don't so don't mess good, this up. So many good things, but you know, one one thing when when a tournament angler who wins a lot says, "This is my winning rig," I write it down, which is the Procure Gulp on a Carolina rig. You know, and I'm a huge, and I hate to out those guys, but I'm a huge Procure fan. I put it on and before I even go to sleep at night because I like it so much. And so I was pretty excited to hear that. And I don't fish tournaments, so no worries, but I'm sure somebody does. I thought they put Procure on cut bait when they go to that tournament oh, yeah, fishing. Yeah. I thought that's what they just admitted to. Oh, that's what it was. Procure on cut bait. Yeah, I got it wrong. <laughs> Procure on everything. <laughs> Um, Billy, tell me how to watch, how to listen. I mean, don't tell me. Tell everyone else. We want we want more audience. Yeah, here we go. So uh, anytime you want to watch or listen, go check us out on Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Google Play. And be sure to subscribe to those so you get a little notification every time that we launch a new episode, which is every week. Uh, starting next week is actually going to, or maybe it's already been, I don't know what episode this is, but it's going to be on Tuesdays instead of Thursdays. <laughs> I might be behind. I might be ahead. Who knows where I'm at? Um, but yeah, so and make sure you tell your friends, your family, all your, all your fishing buddies and pals or whoever. Um, and yeah, tell them to check us out. It's good. Well, I tell you what, man, I don't know if those guys, I don't, I don't know if they're going to get the pro cure sponsorship. I think they worked on it, but I'm, I'm going to put a ploy out there for those guys. Hey, those guys need a Wi-Fi sponsor. They need an internet (laughs) provider sponsor. If anyone out there would like to sponsor a red drum tournament fishing team and you can provide good internet access, then I know the perfect pairing, perfect, Uh even more than Beavis and Bud. Head. I've got it. I've got the pro- I've got the marriage. That is perfect, man. Speaking of great sponsors, Marine Warehouse, thank you guys once again for making this episode possible. If you're in the boat, in the market for a boat, go check those guys out. If you need service or anything, go check them out. Located here in Wilmington, North Carolina. Gary, I have nothing else left, man. It was a great episode. It was a great episode. I'm smiling. I'm going to continue to <laughs> smile. That was a good time and informative. It was awesome. It was great. Look forward to listening to it back. So. Next time, Billy. All right. See ya.